with a ballot You can vote with your wallet But it's always a vote for the pricks So let me tell you this for free My next vote's with a brick Tim, we're here to record another podcast. Yay, uh, podcast. We're, we're recording our third episode of Vote with a Brick. We have a theme song. We're uh, we're in the throes of it now. Um, I'm Steve. You're Tim. I'm I Tim. don't think we need to do any more introduction than that. Uh, and this week, um, we're, we're returning to form. Uh, my original intention for this podcast was for uh, you to maybe educate me on Canadian politics and for me to kind of play the everyman. Uh, ask a lot of questions, uh, get really interested in that stuff. Um, so we're going to do that this week. Uh, we The first week we did uh, a Tim Educates Corner, and this week uh, our episode is basically just going to be that. Um, I will sure. say we're recording this on uh, the morning that uh, Russia has moved into Ukraine, and uh, we're not going to talk about that because uh, I don't think either one of us is qualified to do so. No, I... Um... I even say this to my classes when I teach Canadian politics. I know so little about Canadian foreign policy that I frequently ask a colleague to do a guest lecture if I have to do an introduction to Canadian foreign policy. And I think one of the things that's responsible when you're talking about politics is to highlight the things you're not an expert on. And Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable trying to say anything other than like, war is not great. I think we can yeah. list the things that this podcast is uh, taking a stance on. War, not great. Not not our favorite, no. no. No, But yeah, neither one of us is really in the right place to be talking about it. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's other experts you could tune into uh, if you're listening to this and uh, want to know more so that you can pontificate to your friends about just how bad war is. Yeah, we definitely lost one of our 12 listeners by not saying we are in favor of class war. So we should say that to get that person back. Just... Rage quit our podcast. That's really optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> 12. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so the question you had posed in our notes are, are we a podcast that does follow-ups? And I think we are. I think we should be. Um, we talked a little bit about the Emergency Act last week. Um, so let's talk about that uh, before we get on to other topics. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the Emergency Act was dropped last night. Yes. Um, it uh, it was invoked 10 days ago, I think. Uh, Christopher Eland had said that the Emergency Act was justified by the threat to democracy and the economy, which is an interesting <laughs> way of putting it. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Like, I don't live in Ottawa. Um, I'm pretty sure if I had to deal with three weeks of trucks blaring their horns, horns at all points in time and, like, diesel exhaust i'd be going pretty fucking nuts so Mm. (laughs) uh, like i'm just saying i'm not there but and i can understand how it's like awful and frustrating and bad i just was it a threat to democracy i'm not convinced yeah i mean uh it doesn't seem like they were especially well organized to uh threaten democracy um and it certainly didn't seem like uh the folks who were on the hill were especially concerned about that specifically um, it does seem like the the bigger issue was the threat to the economy. Uh, and we kind of saw that with the borders too, right? It was like, now it's a big deal. It's a yeah. big deal now because it's threatening our trade. It's a big deal now because factories are closing. Um, and that's why those border crossings were cleared before the Emergency Act was enacted. The, so, yeah. The, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if you saw this. The governor general had to tweet out like you can't yep. actually just register with me that you have no confidence in <laughs> in the government it doesn't work that way now yeah. i don't want to <clears throat> i don't want to downplay the pseudo fascism of it all but uh, they many of the protesters were also um standing up for their first amendment rights which a, a tiktoker who i wish i'd written the name down so i could credit had pointed out the first amendment to the canadian constitution recognizes manitoba as a province so we had a bunch of protesters saying they recognize that they have a right to be manitoba i'm yeah. saying i'm not convinced that they present a cohesive th- threat to canadian democracy no, I don't know. I mean, they certainly don't understand it enough to really challenge it. Uh, that's that's one of the issues. Um, but additionally, it's just like it's just not a big enough 
group of people, you know, like that there has been some more sort of populist solidarity protests throughout the country. Um, and those numbers, you know, when you see the videos, it's a little frightening. When you see the videos, you're like, boy, that's a that's a big group of people. Um, but it's not really, you know, like we've seen much bigger protests from the left. Um, and uh, yeah, I just don't. The numbers don't seem to be there, you know what I mean? Uh, it's a little frightening when people are bringing guns to these things, obviously. Yeah, no, that, that's a problem. It, yeah. I just want to put a button on the thing, the democracy part. I think the bigger threat to democracy is, I don't know, a militarized police force of which there's no real civilian control over at all. Like, right. the protest in Ottawa continued for the length of time it did largely because the Ottawa police force didn't want to do their jobs. Now we can debate <clears throat> defunding the police and <laughs> if we are in favor of police doing their jobs but as long as we have them it really does seem like the now former police chief was like yeah I'm not going to do anything about this and then once the emergency act was invoked and, and police were told go clear out the protest they did so, I don't know, if we have a police force where cops are letting protesters take pictures in the back of their car with them and saying, we're on side with you, and tweeting out the same message as the protesters, and not enforcing the law, that seems to be a threat to democracy more than a bunch of, like, yahoos in their trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was listening to the Bottom End podcast, and they had Matt Christman on from Chapo Trap House, and uh, he made this really... Well, very long-winded um, comparison between like trucker owner operators and sort of frontier cowboys and individualism, rugged individualism, and how the police force, like cops, are sort of the last vestige of that sort of type of rugged individualism. You know, all the other sort of uh, industries, all the other opportunities to better your life have been co-opted by capitalism in such a way that you're just working for someone else, that you're you're being exploited for your labor and you're alienated from your labor, you're alienated from the ability to enact your ideals uh, in your work. Uh, the only kind of job where that's allowed at this point are cops. Cops get to determine the law while they're out in the streets, yeah. you know. Um, and so there's an unwillingness to, to attack the protesters because they are looking into a mirror was the point that he made. For like the last 20 to 25 years, academics community organizers, people who study extremism, federal police agencies like the FBI and CSIS to the extent that you want to trust anything they say, you shouldn't trust anything they say, have, <laughs> uh, have all said the greatest threat in North America right now is radical right-wing extremism. And then we get like the seeds of radical right-wing extremism and the police do nothing about it. Se seems to be a problem to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a problem that's going to stay with us. Um, so the Emergency Act has been dropped. Um, but, you know, these folks have networked. They've organized uh, already. And uh, the sort of the damage is done in that sense. And they'll be complaining about this, even though it's been dropped. Uh, even though, um, you know, it, it was used in the way that uh, Trudeau first sort of announced it was going to be announced or, or was going to be used, right? That it was going to be used to clear the streets. It was going to be used to get sort of back to business as usual um, and then dropped. And that has been the case, but they're still going to complain about it for years to come. I think if you're someone who broadly identifies on the political left, like the thing you should find worrisome is Christopher Freeland saying that this was used because there was a threat to the economy yep. because th that that's what unions do when they go on strike. Strikes are mm -hmm. an exercise in economic power. We already had <clears throat> with the Harper regime, there was some cabinet minister. I forget who I think it's Lisa, it was Lisa Raitt. I'll take your word for it. This is another tip. If something terrible happened in the Harper administration, assume Lisa Raitt was involved. She's terrible. She had said that, you know, we should declare the economy an essential service. And so if we're saying a threat to the economy is a national emergency, if you're a person who believes that one of the ways that working people can better their lives is through union actions, this is a warning shot that mm -hmm. we are increasingly going to see clampdowns on strikes. Yeah. Yeah, and the Canadian public will support it. The yep. Canadian public will will be happy to allow the police to clear out protesters from all sides uh, as long as uh, there's a tangible threat to 
their bottom line essentially or their you know retirement fund or their investments and i think maybe the last thing i'll say to tie into that before we can move on is Mm -hmm. like there were a lot of people online who seemed to be vaguely left of center you know anywhere from like center left all the way over to the borders of the hard left who are like, it's great that this is happening. It's like, yeah. are, you, are we celebrating that this we've just handed over the state and police sweeping powers to, to do whatever they want? Like, this seems bad. Again, I'm going to loop back around. I wasn't living in Ottawa. I would be going nuts. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The other thing I'll say is I don't know how else this crisis, if it was a crisis, was going to be ended. You know, it seems like the failure was stopping it from happening in the first place. I don't know how else it was going to be ended. But I don't think we should be really excited that we gave the state a bunch of powers to do whatever they want. Again, seems bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's move on. I I, I agree. I I saw that as well. The, The people on the left, you know, sort of bloodthirsty. Uh, and I, you know, at moments fell victim to it myself mm. um, because it is it's just so frustrating. And you're you're frustrated by the injustice of it. You know, the fact that one side is allowed to just run rampant on our capital. And, you know, when we try to organize protests, we're very quickly stomped down by the state. Yeah. Um, so there's there's certainly there's reasons to get swept up in that sort of, uh, you know, these guys are finally getting theirs kind of narrative. Um, but I think we have to be better than that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, on to electoralism. Um, I think today you wanted to sort of broadly speak about, you know, the sort of the history of uh, what you were referring here to the electable left in Canada. Sure, yeah. Um, and so I think we're going to start with sort of some historical context uh, leading up to um, today. Yeah, uh, you know, I we we named this podcast "Vote with a Brick" from Lois of the Low Song, um, and I was thinking about this because I think almost anyone who's ever spent any time on the on the left, whether they got into the left through electoral politics or otherwise, has this uneasy relationship with voting. You know, do we yeah. go out and vote? Do we not? Um, so some things that have always popped in into mind, right? The the song the song lyrics that Ron Hawkins wrote is no matter who you vote for, it's a vote for the pricks. Mm-hmm. Um, Anarchist saying, you know, don't vote; it only encourages them. And my personal favorite is, if voting could change anything, they'd make it illegal. Right. So the the left has this idea that voting doesn't do much, and so if you vote, you're um, implicitly encouraging a system that you are actively opposed to yeah so i think but then a lot of us on the left like drag our fetid and rotting corpses to the voting booth (laughs) once every like however many years to like be like well i'm doing this under protest and so like how does this tension so i thought so people can call us giant hypocrites um My personal history with electoralism, Uh, I have voted in every election I've been eligible to vote in. Every municipal, Mm -hmm. every provincial, every federal election, I have voted. I do this frequently after saying, I don't want to vote. I don't like any of the choices. I frequently only decide to vote on election day and go like, fine, I will go and vote. Um, I have being a member of the NDP and torn up my membership card to the NDP on three separate occasions. <laughs> um, you got a physical card? Oh yeah, no, a physical card that I have that I have ripped up at least three times. Um, mm. The only other thing I'll say is, and this ties into it, my first provincial election that I could vote into, I lived in the riding that Peter Cormos was the representative for. And some people on the left in Canada will know the name Peter Cormos, and others will not. But he was this maverick in the Ontario NDP, um, and he was a legitimate socialist. Like, he believed in socialism and talked and frequently criticized his own party for not being left enough and for not advocating for socialism enough. So part of my DNA with electoral politics is... I voted for someone 
when I first turn voting age, who probably is very close to the politics that I have right now. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's my um, that's my history with electoralism. Yeah, I mean, likewise, I have voted in every election that I've had an opportunity to. Um, I am someone who feels strongly that um, we can't just advocate our responsibility in that sense. Um, I, I understand definitely people who don't want to vote. I understand uh, being critical of voting. I understand uh, not feeling like there are any representatives that represent you. Um, but I also recognize that, you know, if we don't, if we cede that ground, then things only get worse, right? Um, and so that's that's kind of where I've landed on this. I'm lucky right now um, that, that I have representatives who, who do represent me, uh, living in Hamilton Center. I have Andrea Horwath on the one hand and Matthew Green on the other. It's real easy to vote for those two. Um, I do think that they represent a progressive uh, movement, and uh, in the case of Matthew, you know, true socialist. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's easy for me right now. Uh, it has not always been that easy. When I lived in Toronto, actually, I voted for the Liberals at one point. In fact, I gave a vote towards um, uh, Justin Trudeau and the first time that he came around. And partly it was because at the time he was promising electoral reform. Um, and I thought, you know, well, that would be great because yeah. then I never had to vote for these assholes again. <laughs> so same, and, uh, same. Yeah, yeah. And the carpet was pulled out from under me, and uh, and I think a lot of Canadians uh, afterwards. Yeah, if only um, there had been a series of clues from the last hundred and fifty years that the Liberal Party will lie to you. You and I would not feel so betrayed as we did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't surprised. I'll put it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand. I understand people who who feel that it is, you know, a vote for the pricks, um, and and don't feel like there is any point in voting. I understand the sentiment. I would encourage them to maybe think, like maybe think less critically. Vote against the real pricks, you know, because yeah. there are lives that hang in the balance. We're seeing that right. I mean, we're seeing that right now, right? Today we're talking on February twenty fourth. Yesterday, the Texas governor put in a new law that essentially amounts to genocide against trans people. Um, and like, we're lucky in this country that we don't have to choose between just two parties, um, that there are other, you know, potentially elect <laughs> yeah. electorable. So, uh, I think let's talk about voting on the left and then we'll loop back around there because I share the okay. same sentiment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. So take us through it, Tim. I so, want to hear all about the CFF. <laughs> Again, the CCF. Thing that, <laughs> so this is a CCR podcast where you're just going to go listen to Fortunate Son now on repeat for 40 minutes. Um, I just like the other thing I want to say, and this is part of my problems with being a, a baked in academic is this is a very short history. There are going to be people who are going to be, if they listen to this, who are upset that I'm like missing parts and skipping out. And that, that's fine. And you're you're not wrong. I just don't want to do... No, they're like, wrong. I just don't want to do three hours on the NDP. So, okay. you know, historic... No one does. Not even members of the NDP want to do three hours on the NDP. So historically, like, a social democratic party was always critical of capitalism. So if we talk about some of these early social democratic parties, um, you know, the social democratic party in, in many of the Nordic states, particularly the Swedish social democrats... The German Social Democrats, the early British Labour Party, they were social democracy parties that believed in socialism, like socialism through the ballot box. They mm -hmm. were critical of capitalism, wanted to replace it with something else. And over time, that morphed into like, eh, eh, markets are fine, I guess, but maybe we should just like file away the rough edges of markets. So, so what's the time frame? What's the time frame we're talking about here? We're talking about like the nineteen twenties, thirties. Yeah, I think so. Like a lot of these these parties, these social democratic parties that were socialist, sort of first appeared in the nineteen nineteen tens, nineteen twenties. I think the Swedish social democrats took power around nineteen in the nineteen tens to nineteen twenties. I could look that up. I'm not going to, but that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, so. And even at that point in time, they were socialists. They wanted to do away with markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it this was in the context of sort of the Great Depression. Yeah. And yeah, so a bad economic time. Hey, yeah. hey, we're in one of those right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the the CCF, the uh, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, full name Cooperative Commonwealth Federation Farmer Labor Socialist, but hilariously referred to uh, by their detractors as the Crazy Communist Farmers. Um, Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that that's a better name for a party. Um, <laughs> I would vote for the Crazy Communist Farmers in a second. Mm-hmm. So, so the goal of the CCF, so it's a it's a it's a populist party comes out of the prairie provinces comes out of saskatchewan explicit goal is to um eradicate capitalism replace it with a centrally planned socialist economy um they have this uh, the founding documents called the uh, regina manifesto um i i don't know i do if we have show notes can you maybe find a link to the regina manifesto and, and put it in the show notes Sure, I can yeah. do that. Okay, <laughs> so you know, I'll, I'll just put a little bit. Quote: Community freed from the domination of irresponsible financial and economic power, in which all social means of production and distribution, including land, are socially owned and controlled either by voluntarily organized groups of producers and consumers, or, in the case of major public services and utilities and such productive and distributive enterprises as can be conducted uh, most efficiently when owned in common by public corporations responsible to the people's elected representatives. Sounds good to me. Yeah, it, it's a manifesto for socialism. Yeah. So, like, eradicate yeah. capitalism, take control of the land, take control of the commanding heights of the economy, control them by the public. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, absolutely. That is something which I could vote for today. Yeah, I mean, uh, what if it was the crazy communist truckers, you know? I'd vote for them. I don't know. <laughs> it's not truckers I have a problem with. It's no. the fascism. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, the fascism is a problem. So the CCF, the CCF calls for things like universal pensions, universal health care. The Tommy Douglas administration in Saskatchewan famously, Father Medicare introduces universal public health care there unemployment insurance social programs so sort of that idea of like well if we're elected on day one day two we can't get rid of capitalism so what do we do between point a and and point b and introduce Mm -hmm. broad social programs to make lives easier for working people i'll tell you like uh working with the ndp we still campaign on tommy douglas uh we still campaign on universal (laughs) health care uh i know i can see you shaking your head um but you know like it's it's broadly popular, you know, like that. It's a very difficult thing to argue with. People in this country love their universal health care. It is like one of the things that people will point to when they when they love to do that comparison with the United States, mm-hmm. right? Oh, we're so much better than the United yeah. States because we have universal health care. So there's an attitude, certainly, that people want at least some forms of socialism in this country. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just the ones that are palatable to them. Yeah, I, I was only shaking my head because. I don't know that Tommy Douglas would recognize the NDP today. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely not. So CCF turns into the NDP, 1961. CCF basically has a problem becoming a- electable Ontario and eastward. They have mm. electoral success uh, in the Prairie Provinces, can't break into Ontario, so they, they form the NDP uh, in 1961. So first, 1956, the Winnipeg Declaration uh, replaces the Regina Manifesto. If you're shifting away from a manifesto to anything else, you're selling out. If your key (laughs) document is not a manifesto, you're no longer a socialist party. Um, So the Winnipeg Declaration replaces the Regina Manifesto and very explicitly moves the party off of socialism. So they say... is this kind of in the context of like the post-war compromise um, or what we would recognize as, as being a post-war compromise in the United States? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a part of, so there's a bunch of things going on. There's mm-hmm. the threat, threat of communism, right? This idea that um, if we're a socialist party, many people said, well, the CCF is now just going to take orders from Moscow. Right. Yeah. Big red. Yeah. <clears throat> there's the idea that they want to be electable in... Ontario, and they say, well, we need to moderate ourselves to win over voters in Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it, it's a bunch of things. It's an acceptance of the post-war compromise. 
uh, and says, okay, so we're not going to be socialist anymore. We're just going to be a moderate social democratic party. But again, there was a critique of markets. So it's the idea that markets should be controlled using like Keynesian economic principles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, a broad belief in trade unionism, a broad belief in social programs, a broad belief in expanding the welfare state, all sorts of these things that, again, while not socialist, are to the left of where the other electoral parties are in Canada. I wonder, with the, you're saying, like, obviously, they're having trouble breaking into Ontario, like, what do you think motivated that like what was the what was the challenge there from you know i there was a lot of like well this is a party of western protest like who are these people in ontario there was a labor wing of the liberal party into the, like the 40s and 50s like labor mps mpps provincially um so it was yeah it was a, a difficulty of convincing sort of industrial workers in Ontario that this party of farmers would represent their interests. Mm -hmm. So the NDP like exists in the sixties and seventies. Um, <laughs> they, they do fairly well. They elect some members of parliament. They uh, there's a few instances where they sort of form uh, opposition in Ontario. I think I forget when I know they did, or they came close to it. Um, this is someone screaming that I'm getting my history wrong, but the, the, the takeaway is they never form government. Mm. Right? They never form government uh, there. Uh, I want to now, now we have to talk about neoliberalism. Oh, goody. I can't <laughs> wait. Um, so because, because we, we cut off our introduction short, uh, I'm an academic and i still have academic brain worms and, you know, academics use the word neoliberalism a lot <laughs> I, I, yeah <laughs> i lecture on it a lot like part of my job is to explain what neoliberalism is but i always get torn because i don't know how many people outside of academia actually know what neoliberalism is you know a lot of median the median canadians like is this something to do with the liberal party and they're like well it is but not really yeah if you're terminally online, you may have heard the terms like late stage capitalism. Um, a lot of people use the phrase American style conservatism. We can talk about like Thatcherism or Reaganism. I think for the purposes of these discussions, we can say all of those things are signaling neoliberalism. And again, yeah, there definitely are differences between all of those different things. But if someone's talking about late late stage capitalism, whether they know it or not, they're talking about neoliberalism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but without knowing what any of those terms mean in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that's sort of useful is if you want to explain to someone <laughs> why things are really messed up, you don't mm -hmm. want to do a 20 minute lecture on social theory, which no, is what I'm but doing. we're going to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so if you're interested in neoliberalism, and I'm pointing downwards again, like there's show notes beneath it, Steve is going to put in the show notes A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey. I mm. recommend this to anybody that's interested in this. David Harvey is a Marxist geographer, and his book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, he wrote to be accessible, to be readable yeah. outside of the academy. And I think it's it's something that if you're really interested in this topic, go find it and read it. It's it's a really useful book. Yeah, I will say as a as someone who uh, struggles with reading, um, I found it accessible. So if I can read it, you can. Yeah. And, and Harvey understands, and so so do I. Um, understands neoliberalism as a class based project. It's a project to restore class power that was lost during the post-war compromises. So he says, you know, it's a set of economic and political practices, restores class power. And I think this is useful because we can say, like, neoliberalism has redistributed money upwards. Wealth has moved back up. There is a growing income gap mm -hmm. in industrialized democracies. 
Um, yeah. And has been for the 50 years now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, shrinking the state. So getting the state out of markets, like reducing the size of the state. Replace social programs with markets, right? So, for example, um, we no longer get uh, eye examinations in Ontario for free, right? You have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. Um We've replaced a social program with markets, um, busting unions, busting any sort of form of social solidarity. Uh, Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society. There's just individuals and their families. Yeah. And, you know, get rid of any sort of institution, community organizing, but especially trade unions. Reduce the burden, you know, get rid of unions, make it harder to form uh make it harder to uh collectively bargain etc mm-hmm. yeah i was gonna say too like there's a there's a rewriting of um a rewriting of i was gonna say history but it's more like a rewriting of reality the other the other famous quote that people like to throw around from margaret thratcher is that you know we've reached the end of history yeah right the idea that there's a struggle between the right and the left has been undermined by this notion that we've reached the end of that. We All we have now is markets. We don't really need to worry about this sort of back and forth between the left and right anymore. The market will take care of it. And, uh, and you know, we don't, we don't really have that struggle to worry about anymore. Obviously, we do. Yeah. Obviously, you know, uh, in, in a very real sense, the right has won. When I think of neoliberalism, I think of it as almost like a continuum between like the center left parties, the liberals in this country, all the way to um, libertarian Mm -hmm. uh, sort of ethics, you know, like like libertarianism is neoliberalism taken to its nth degree, where literally there is no state that that, you know, we just are individuals um, and that we can somehow organize society through just like individual um, wants and desires, which is obviously... (laughs) insane like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think anyone listening to this podcast <laughs> needs more uh more than the, just that but um but yeah i mean it's 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 insane it's an absolutely uh infantile idea of how we should be organizing our societies um but you know to a degree uh the center centrist uh liberal parties both here in the united states like you know advocate that just yeah. in fewer words we can really debate if we're interested as academics when neoliberalism came put. Uh, generally, we say the transformation from Keynesianism to neoliberalism happened started sometime in the late 1960s and ended sometime in the, the mid 1980s. Uh, you know, in the Canadian case, I always say 1988, the free trade election in 1988 is when neoliberalism solidified itself here. A lot of other people say, more accurately, 1990s with NAFTA, um, but whatever. Starts in the late 1960s, ends in the mid to late 1980s. Canada's neoliberalized by then. What does this have to do with electoralism? Neoliberalism does imply a restrained set of policy choices. Fewer options are considered viable, right? The political imagination of what governments can and can do is restricted it it shrank we can no longer talk about crown corporations right we can't talk about nationalizing companies to provide services through a crown corporation you can't talk about extremely high levels of taxation on corporate profits and high levels of individual wealth Free trade is sort of the only type of trade you can talk about, right? Like the opening up of borders. Right. There are still policy options, but those policy options are constrained and they're neoliberal. So the point here is that it it has pushed political parties together, right? The differences between the political parties that are electable are fewer and more imperceptible. There is a broad agreement between the electable parties in Canada on an economic consensus around neoliberalism. Mm-hmm. No matter who you vote for, you're going to get a variety of neoliberalism. The the one of the phrases that's come into vogue lately is the Overton window, right? We've, yeah. We've, people talk about shifting the Overton window, but what you're describing now is a narrowing of that window. Yeah. Um, making it, you know, really 
defined in the center um, such that, you know, these folks who don't want to vote, when they say that they uh, they feel like their vote doesn't matter, that it really doesn't matter, you know, which of the electable parties they elect, it's all going to be the same. They're not wrong. Um, that window is so narrow and the differences between the parties es- es- essentially imperceptible, as you said. Yeah. So concretely, Every major political party in Canada has introduced back-to-work legislation to end legal strikes. Every yep. major political party in Canada has voted in favor of back-to-work legislation to end mm-hmm. legal strikes. Um, there's this really celebrated case in the mid-1990s where the federal liberal government introduced back-to-work legislation to end a strike of striking dock workers the only party who voted against it was the Bloc Québécois. The NDP voted for back-to-work legislation, and, and Gilles Duceppe, then leader of the ND, or leader of the Bloc Québécois, said, "Like, what does it say that a party that is dedicated to breaking up Canada is the only party that is willing to stand up for the rights of dock workers in British Columbia?" Yeah, yeah. What does that say? Yeah, right. That... <laughs> <laughs> you know, all three. You know, the, the New Democrats, the Liberals and the Conservatives are all broadly in favor of markets. You're not getting that rhetoric about nationalizing the commanding heights of the economy. There's a broad consensus on free trade. The NDP would say, well, we actually believe in fair trade, or I think they now say fair free trade. There's a broad <laughs> consensus on low tax corporate tax rates. You're, you're not getting much variation there. Right. And... One of the things that I think is useful when we talk about the NDP is the NDP and a bunch of other social democratic parties around the world in an era of neoliberalism sort of transformed themselves into parties of the welfare state. They said, well, we're no longer getting rid of markets. We're no longer nationalizing the commanding heights of the economy. We're the party that is here to say we should have better social programs. The problem was when governments started undoing social programs and the public public consciousness shifted to social programs are bad, now social democratic parties and the NDP itself have an identity which is torn out from underneath them. They're on their back feet as well, right? Like you're you're constantly in this this struggle um, rather than advocating for a better world, something to replace... Uh, the dominant structure, something to replace capitalism, replace markets. You're just constantly at the margins trying to defend uh, against the further erosion of that welfare state. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's kind of a losing argument, right? It's it's vote for us, we'll protect the few little dregs of, uh, of the welfare state that remains, as opposed to vote for us, we're going to make it way better. <laughs> like, we're going to, we're you know, we're going to make it so that you don't have to worry about, um, you know, not being able to afford glasses, for instance, right? Um, or dental care or whatever, you know, like any of those social programs. They're things that are broadly supported, I think. Um, but when people see them getting further eroded, you know, year after year, um, they don't have a lot of faith that anyone is actually going to uh, improve them, make them better. And again, when you said as well, like this, this sort of, Broad consensus on keeping tax rates low. Um, people believe in the dream that they're going to one day be rich, and therefore we shouldn't put new taxes on rich people because that'll be me one day. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that makes it impossible, right? It makes it impossible to implement new social programs, new aspects of the welfare state that can actually help people because there's just no tax base less than, left anymore. We've, we've eroded that too. So... Um, you're right that the rug has been pulled out um, from these progressive parties. Uh, and like I was saying, you know, they're on their back feet. They're, they're in this, this, constant, um, this constant state of just resisting the worst impulses of neoliberalism as opposed to trying to actually uh, ameliorate those circumstances in the first place. We should talk about the waffle. The waffle. Yeah, I don't know what this is, but I now I want waffles. <laughs> yeah, so the waffle got their name. Um, the waffle, okay, the waffle was, the official title was a movement for an independent socialist Canada. They were a group within the NDP 
formed in 1969 to push the NDP to the left and implicitly all of Canada to the left. They got called the Waffle because it was they were being made fun of by Ed Broadbent that said this group, if they had to choose between waffling to the left and waffling to the right, they'd waffle to the left on every single issue. So these people were like, well, that's a good name because we will waffle to the left on every single issue. <laughs> So I think we, this is a marketing problem. Like, they should have just said, yeah, you're right. Free waffles for everybody. For everybody yeah. <laughs> um, so they called for... So the thing is, they were a socialist movement within the NDP. They called hmm. for the NDP to advocate for the nationalization of Canadian industries, but particularly to take them out of the hands of American interests. So the waffle saw the biggest threat to Canada as American corporations. They said American corporations are, are taking over Canada. Um, and so they, the, the, the Waffle Manifesto, again, manifesto is good, declaration is bad. Um, mm -hmm. A socialist society must be one in which there is a democratic control of all institutions which have a major effect on men's lives and where there is equal opportunity for creative and non-exploitative self-development it is now time to go beyond the welfare state right free waffles so, yeah free waffles um yeah so they're a socialist movement but they're also like a canadian nationalist movement you know a strong independent socialist canada um and so they exist as a party within a party basically mm -hmm. Uh, and in 1972, the leader of the Ontario NDP, Stephen Lewis, who a lot of people really like as he's a great orator, he's he's done uh, excellent work. Uh, um, he was, you know, he's had a long interest in fighting AIDS. It's hard to critique Stephen Lewis for his humanitarian work. But when he was the leader of the NDP, he described the waffle as, quote, an encumbrance around my neck, end quote. <laughs> and he moved the NDP to pass a motion that ordered the waffle to either disband or leave. So Stephen Lewis and his father, who was in the federal NDP, David Lewis, had this centrist establishment purge to purge the left waffle. So, you know, like, you have to either leave the NDP and start your own party or disband. Right. And so there was this moment where, you know, forced to push the NDP back to the left, back to socialism, gets broken up by the establishment. I wonder, uh, I got a couple, like, one thing I wanted to do was sort of make the comparison. Like, is this, you know, to understand this sort of in the context of U.S. politics, is this like the squad, essentially? Um, a sort of like a, a band of progressive uh, party members that were trying to push the envelope, um, push things towards the left? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very, very good comparison. Um, and then, and then, so... Um, in that process of trying to push or, or well i mean trying to consolidate the ndp as a centrist party and push these folks out um do you i mean would it would you think that would happen today like if there was a group of progressive ndpers um that wanted to kind of return to a more um directly antagonistic sort of relationship to capital um would they be pushed out in the same way these days i i think so i think that's fair to say like i don't you do think so okay <laughs> i i i think I don't even think the NDP Socialist Caucus exists anymore. Right. Uh, there used to be a Socialist Caucus within the NDP. They used to always contest the leadership no matter what. I don't think they're functionally organized anymore. Like, okay. yeah. Um, Just because they're not now, though. I mean, I'm asking you to forecast, and I know that's not uh, <laughs> that's not something yeah. that academics like to do. No. But, um, but, I mean, do you think that there actually might be a window for that in, in this moment? So I teach students who I think have fairly strong socialist ideas. I mean, yeah, probably. But I think, but I think they see that playing out in social movements and not electoral politics, right? I don't mm. think they want to join a political party, organize within that party to move it to the left. 
Right. Yeah. They think that political power is organized in the streets. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So 1988 federal election disaster for the NDP. They went into the polls leading, looking like they were going to form government. This was a election that was a referendum on a free trade agreement with the United States. Um, they were opposed to free trade, but they also campaigned on other issues when most of their trade union allies said you have to have one single issue because the liberals and the conservatives do. Brian Mulroney gets elected, free trade gets signed. Um, the Bob Ray government, the new Democratic Bob Ray government, Bob Ray used to be a new Democrat, leader mm -hmm. of uh, government in Ontario in 1990, was a total disaster. Um, yeah. I mean, the only thing anyone remembers, right, is Ray days. That's all anyone yeah. remembers in the Bob Ray government. <clears throat> can, you, can you give us a bit of a what what are ray days so in the in 1990 there was the largest global recession since the uh since the great depression in 1990 to hit the democratic world um we saw we use that phrase again multiple times after the 1990 but huge yeah, <laughs> yeah it's huge 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 depression the, the largest depression since the next one yeah it um the NDP says, okay, we're going to use Keynesianism. Keynesianism measures don't respond. They say we've got to control government debt. Uh, and they introduce this piece of legislation called the Social Contract Act. And the Social Contract Act was designed to open up previously negotiated collective agreements and implement a wage freeze on them. And this was seen as the ultimate betrayal from a new democratic government saying, mm -hmm. you know, trade union leaders said we would expect this from the liberals or conservatives, but we have for 30 years advocated voting for you guys mm -hmm. because it's not supposed to come from you. Yeah. You're not supposed to do this. You're supposed to respect collective agreements. Um, at the top of the podcast, I referenced Peter Cormos. So Peter Cormos was a member of the, Bob Ray government and was one of four sitting New Democrats to vote against his own government, to vote against the Social Contract Act, saying, like, it's mm -hmm. wrong. New Democrats aren't supposed to do this. Is that, do you think that's the difference between sort of a party that is um, trying to be electable and a party that is actually governing? Like, do you think that, you know, they got in and then realized, oh, well, actually, we can't do all these things? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, we could do an entire. Uh, an entire episode of uh, of the disastrous that was the Bob Ray government next um, week. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the only thing I'll say about this is one of my favorite anecdotes in uh, in Canadian politics is they did not expect to be elected mm. at all uh, to the point where there was one person who ran as a paper candidate, someone who just signed up to be a name on the ballot. Yep. Uh, it was, he was an 18 year old hot dog cart vendor uh, who mm. did not campaign at all and realized he was a member of provincial parliament the day after the election, when he woke up and read in the newspaper that he had been elected. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and we should have more working people in government the point is they were totally unprepared to govern. Yeah. Um, so after the Ray government and the 1988 election, the NDP becomes banished to the political wilderness. They have a mm -hmm. hard time maintaining official party status. Uh, and like they become a party that's basically, you know, what's good social programs. And I agree, social programs are good, but that was sort of all that the party stood for. Right. Yeah, I mean, we see this today, right? Yeah. And they've also, in the process as well, like, um, I don't know, you and I have talked a little bit, you know, about, like, the way that sort of unions have abandoned the NDP or, or you know, don't necessarily vote lockstep uh, in that direction mm -hmm. anymore. Um and don't even really advocate for it at like leadership levels. And I would attribute it all to this moment, right? Yeah. Um, this this sort of abandoning of unions and selling them out. You don't recover from that. You no. know, those people are still around. And especially within unions, especially within, you know, sort of the uh, leadership ranks, like those people are probably still there, you know, in a lot of cases. I, you know, 
it is 2022. There are still people who are disaffected voters because they said the only party I have ever voted for was the New Democrats. And then Bob Ray came in and tore up my collective agreement. I'm not going to I still haven't forgiven Bob Ray 30 years later, so I don't vote mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I can speak from experience. I heard that on the campaign trail um, this past year. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's hard to argue with that. So the last sort of stop on, on, on my little tour here, um, not little, this, this tour is the New Politics Initiative, which we briefly mentioned in our first episode about Alexa McDonough. Yeah. New Politics Initiative, the NPI, formed within the NDP in, in 2001, and it was an organization within the NDP calling for the NDP to move to the left. That sounds familiar. Yeah, except not as far left as socialism, right? They weren't going to be the waffle they said the ndp should move to the left but we're not going to be a socialist party Mm. and they said at this point in time uh the ndp is just the liberal party light why what are we how are we different from the um from the liberals we should move to the left they faced fierce resistance from within the party including from alexa mcdonough herself right um and the party establishment did everything it could to sort of marginalize the new politics initiative Jack Layton was seen broadly as an ally of the NPI. He never joined the NPI. When he became leader of the New Democratic Party, the NPI abandoned itself, saying, ah, we've achieved our victory. Right, okay. And, like, uh, man, that that Jack Layton campaign, that first campaign was, I think, uh, that was really inspiring, I think, for a lot of us on the left for all for all we can fault Jack Layton for some of his dubious stances on, you know, increasing police power. Like he did for the first time in a generation talk about social democracy. Yeah. And he motivated a lot of voters, right? Like people talk about the orange crush and that's, he was a strong leader and that, that's like something that, you know, people want. They, 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 they desire strong party leaders, uh, and they vote for party leaders, unfortunately. They don't vote for no. their <laughs> local candidates. It was... The the one thing I'll say is, it was the first campaign that Leighton fought as leader of the party, and it was the first day, and he was in Newfoundland, and he was campaigning against bank fees. Mm. And I remember this moment where he was asked... He was either asked or heckled about socialism. I forget if it was an ask or a a heckle, but he responded, the NDP is not a socialist party, my friend. Right. And so, like, yeah, so the NPI says, well, we're successful in getting Leighton as a leader, but then Leighton's like, we're not socialist. Um, And so Leighton passes away. He's replaced with Tom Mulcair. Tom Mulcair excellent leader of the opposition when he was grilling uh stephen harper over the senate scandal like everyone's like this excellent parliamentarian did not translate well to um the campaign trail in 2015 he legitimately campaigned to the right of justin trudeau right that election was trudeau was to the left of tom mulcair tom yep. mulcair because of this, sort of ousted as the leader of the party, replaced with Jagmeet Singh. The people around Jagmeet Singh are the same people that were around Tom Mulcair, who are the same people that were around Jack Layton, sort of these vaguely center-left party establishment types. Mm -hmm. And so that brings us to today, and like, what does the NDP stand for? All the way back to the CCF, they had a clear vision that was about transforming society that they were pushing for in elections. I can't tell you what the NDP stands for today, and I don't know that the NDP can, because where was, after the most recent election, where was, it's a minority parliament, if you want the NDP to vote in favor of liberal motions, you were you will deliver the following five things within your first year in office. But there were no demands made. No. No. It was sort of a get-along-to-go-along to kind of... Um, uh, agreement i would say between the liberals and the ndp um and people see that they see it you know they've seen that throughout um the last i mean however many years at this point under justin trudeau 
Um, but even, you know, even to look at the most recent example, um, what I've seen online is a lot of people who support the trucker convoy um, saying that the NDP has sold them out, um, is not listening to them either because they just sort of went along with the Emergencies Act. And, you know, those criticisms are coming from, I think, a place of ignorance. Um, they're coming from a place of, you know, we still want to have our hot tub party in, in, mm -hmm. on Parliament Hill and, and we don't care. Um, but I think somewhere in the center, somewhere around like, progressive leaning sort of centrists as well they see the ndp as just sort of this party that votes with the liberals and doesn't really have an identity of their own the thing about the ndp today is like to loop it back around you can't fault people who are on the hard left for not wanting to participate for saying okay so this is a party that doesn't i can't really tell you what it stands for Mm -hmm. They don't really have a critique of neoliberalism. They certainly don't have a critique of markets. So why do I vote for them? And especially yeah. within the context of an electoral system, which does not translate votes into seats particularly well of saying, you want me to go to the polling station to vote for a candidate who I don't believe in, who's not going to win anyway. Mm hmm. <laughs> right like that is yeah. not a prospect that inspires a lot of people no no i mean here's what i'll say with my with my very limited experience of uh you know getting more involved in uh the riding association here um and and generally just sort of like hanging around um a couple different campaigns now um the best way to challenge that, and I would say to anyone out there who's listening who, you know, uh, maybe hasn't voted or feels, you know, disengaged from voting and, and sort of just goes through the motions the way that you and I do is like, take it over. Like, mm -hmm. you can join the Riding Association and push it to the left from the inside. Uh, and we're, we're very privileged, I think, in this country that we do have a third party that is electable um, and that used to stand for things um, and, and could again, right? So yeah. that's why I was posing this question to you earlier about would a socialist, uh, more, you know, explicitly socialist kind of uh, wing of the NDP, would they be ousted today? Um, and I, I don't know. I, I don't know that they would. I think that, you know, we've talked last week, we talked about the, the trucker convoy, and we've talked about, you know, whether that's a working class movement. I mean, you and I both agree that it, it isn't broadly. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel quite strongly that there are people who have been duped into thinking it is. And, the reason that is the case is because we have not actually reached out to those people in a very long time. I think if we did and we got that sort of popular support, it would be much harder, I think, than to ouster a explicitly socialist wing of the NDP because they would have their own sort of voting block that's that's you know actually loyal to them and therefore sort of props up specific candidates, you know, like again i see that here in hamilton but like to make the comparison to the states again that's kind of what happened and is you know continues to happen with the sort of trumpist movement is that the establishment conservatives would love to get rid of that guy you know they would love to not be associated with this like explicitly racist um um you know bent of the conservative party but they don't even have that option anymore they, they can't. They can't even criticize him, you know, on a lot of points because they will lose that voting block that they've depended on for so long. So, OK, voting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, the, the anarchist saying if voting could change anything, they'd make it illegal. Mm -hmm. and, and I come back to this because they mm -hmm. are trying to make it illegal. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yep. Like the struggle. So the struggle for voting rights has always been an important part of the left. The, you know, the earliest left political parties in Europe formed around the enfranchisement of the work of working men. And then this led to struggles for the enfranchisement of women and then through to the civil rights movements for the, the rights of black Americans to vote. You know, the left has always pushed for more voting rights. Mm hmm. And in the United States, voting rights are coming under attack. They are broadly yeah. coming under attack from the Republican Party. They are especially attacking the voting rights of black Americans. Mm -hmm. They are attempting widespread disenfranchisement. 
And so, okay, does this mean that voting can change things? And I think if you understand electoral politics as one facet of class rule, there is an implicit understanding that if you elect a group of people, they're going to try to change things for the better. And so if you don't want your class position challenged, you make it hard for people who are going to challenge that class position to vote, right? So, you know, I look at what's happening in the United States and saying, I broadly agree that there's a limited range of options that, you know, everything is neoliberalism. And yet there's a push to disenfranchise huge swaths of the American working class. So I've, I've always sort of come down and said, okay, yeah, you know what? Voting can change things, but these changes are sometimes imperceptibly small. Yeah, incremental. Yeah. And so here's where I'm going to come down on, on my my position on voting at the end of all of this. So just sort of <laughs> if people are sticking with this podcast, they know what I am. My position, I guess, is, you know, I'm going to be critiqued. My position is essentially a reformist position mm-hmm. that a new democratic government would be better than a conservative government, especially for working people and for equity seeking people. I have found that those who critique voting and saying voting is an exercise in lesser eviltum, which it is, that this critique often comes from a position of privilege. That it's from mm-hmm. people who are broadly going to be fine no matter who forms government. And I have sort of said, like, look, it's not going to be fine for some people. For many equity-seeking groups, there is a difference in their day-to-day lives between, say, a conservative government and a non-conservative government. So if there are these small, imperceptible changes, may as well vote for the slightly lesser evil. And I also say that within the context of my position is that when I say that you can't just have your only political act being voting once every four years, voting Mm. is one political act, but you can engage in many, many different political acts. You can talk to your friends about socialism, which is a political act. You can sign petitions. You can show up to demonstrations. You can show up to protests. You can, as you said, join a riding association, push the NDP to the left, from that riding association, I'm not convinced that will work. You are convinced that will work. So we have the first fraction in the left of this podcast. Um, <laughs> but you can do that. And those are all political actions that seek to push back against a neoliberal conservative worldview. And so if you accept that there's many, many things you can do, then you probably shouldn't feel bad about one of those acts being like, begrudgingly voting for the least evil option yeah yeah i i agree with everything you said uh i um to tie it up in a nice little bow you know at the top of the show we talked about um the texas um uh you know what amounts to basically genocide against uh, trans people um this new bill where teachers have to snitch on students who are considering like gender um, reaffirming surgery or, or anything of that sort. Um, and that, uh, you know, children can be taken from their parents uh, if they're supporting their, their gender affirming uh, care. Um, there are real consequences to, uh, to allowing um, the right to take over our electoral politics. And yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Like, you know, if you're, if you're someone who doesn't want to vote, Here's what I would say: You better be you. Be, you better be campaigning for a better world that you want to advocate for. You better be putting in the work, otherwise, um, to make sure that the right is not seizing that ground. Because every time you don't vote against their worldview, um, you are you're abdicating your responsibility to defend that ground. Um, so you know, don't vote. That's fine. I don't. You know, it doesn't matter to me. But but you better be doing something else. Um, otherwise, yeah, drag your ass to the polls and at least help us, at least help us, uh, prevent the worst things from happening. The people who are represented by the far right in this country have a party, vote consistently, and they want to kill my friends. So help us out, you know? (laughs) 
<laughs> go down there and go down there and check a box, please. You know, once every few years. I I have I guess established myself in three episodes as the um, requisite bearded Marxist who in it is all about class. It is all about class, and yeah. like that you're you're making the point, which I make is like the ruling classes in not only in this country but the ruling classes in the industrial democratic world are very well organized last week mm. talked a little bit about some of the fractures that exist there they're very well organized mm-hmm. and they vote for their class interests so I, yeah. I tend to agree like is the ndp in canada the best representation of working class interests absolutely not is it the current it is it is though the currently the only organized part of those interests so yeah like once every four years go like vote for like milk toast social democracy and then go home and have a shower about it yeah i mean to my final point here i guess would be um i also have been accused of being a class reductionist i do think that identity (laughs) politics to a certain degree is a distraction um i think that you know the class interests uh in this country and in north america broadly increasingly sort of across the globe um, distract people with identity politics. They distract people with culture arguments so that they don't realize that there is a class war going on um, and they're winning. <laughs> They've been winning for, like you said, 50 years or so. Um, it's it's embarrassing. I used to say 40 years, uh, you know, when I was in school and, uh, and that number is just increasing and nothing's really changed. It's just gotten worse, if anything. Um, so... I'm gonna I'm gonna do our summary that we did last last week. I think this is how. So after this discussion, class war good. We are we are pro class war. Wait, we, 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 <laughs> we are pro waffles, whether they be an, a a socialist movement or a delicious tasty treat. Mm-hmm. Um, because my cat showed up during recording, we are still pro cat. We're still pro cat. Um. We are broadly opposed to conservative politics bad. Yeah. 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 And then <laughs> voting indeterminate, probably good, but also bad at the same time. I mean, just be conscious of it, you know, like, yeah. I, I, like if you're going to not vote, do it in the context of a larger political engagement. Um, but if you are going to argue that you shouldn't vote because it's pointless... I don't know. I mean, show me, show me your work. You know, show me where else you're, you're pushing, um, pushing things forward. Okay. Is that a podcast? Waffles good. Waffles good. The barricade in the cool defiance.